HBO's Jane Fonda and Five Acts recounts the uh, true life story of the two-time Oscar-winning actress, activist, and feminist icon. I'm Zach Laws of Gold Derby, and with me now is Susan Lacey, the 14-time Emmy Award-winning director of this documentary. Uh, and Susan, I think that um, last time we talked about this film when it was first coming out, uh, you mentioned that everyone asked you, why five acts? Uh, tell us again, why uh, five acts for Jane Fonda's life? Well, um, to me, it's it was, everybody thinks it's like an act of genius or something, but to me it was sort of logical in the sense that Jane wrote a book in which uh, she wrote that she wanted to understand her first two acts. She was 60, I guess, when she wrote it, in order to understand how to live her third. So the notion of acts was kind of embedded there and, and uh, by Jane herself. And then I thought three acts, that's because she was dividing her life into thirds. And it was very obvious from her book that the four men in her life, from her father to her three husbands, had been the way she had, or they had influenced who she was at the time that she was, in, you know, as obviously as a child, and throughout her life, really, her father, the shadow of her father, the seeking of love of her father, uh, and then her three husbands, uh, starting with Roger Vadim, Tom Hayden, Ted Turner. For each of these husbands, she was a different woman. And uh, it so became obvious to me that this was a five-act film, and the last act being Jane, where Jane finally had come to uh, a, 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 enough self-love and appreciation of who she was and courage to say, I don't need to define my life any longer around a man. I don't need a man to define me. And that had been, I'm not the, the I didn't, she's the one who said that she had to free herself from this and she did. So that's where the five acts came from. Yeah, and I think that's the most, uh, dare I say, surprising revelation of this documentary is that, you know, Jane Fonda uh, is so embedded in our uh, in our memories as this sort of feminist icon. But as your film shows, I mean, that took uh, quite a long time for her to develop that aspect of her own personality. She actually said that uh, when feminism be began, uh, she rejected it. She thought it was a distraction from the real issues, which is fascinating. Uh, and of course, now she, you know, she regrets that. I felt she came to feminism pretty late, but she's made up for lost time. <laughs> yeah, I imagine the Jane Fonda of today saying to the Jane Fonda of, of back then, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, of course, you also um, show uh, the development of her as a performer as well. And I think it's really fascinating within these five acts, you know, you see her, um, like you say, living in the uh, the shadow of her father, who was of course a famous actor, uh, then kind of slowly coming into her own, uh, starting with things like Barbarella and then moving into uh, this great golden period of her career where uh, not only did she become a better actress, but she became very, uh, forceful in the roles that she took, you know, as a, as a producer. Not, not only that, I mean, she started off with ingenue roles that uh, she was the girl next door, she was the, the cheerleader, you know, she was all these silly movies that I uh, I think she would, looks back and goes, oh, why did I ever do that? But it did get, it, it was how she thought of herself even at the time. Remember, she was Miss Army Recruiter of 1950-something or other before she becomes one of the biggest anti-war activists. So we're talking about a woman who shed, you know, herself many times. But um, then she did Barbarella, and she did it to please her husband, Roger Vadim, who was, a, in case your listeners or watchers don't know, was a very, very famous French director who had discovered um, Bridget Bardot and did a movie called And God Created Women. So, and he was a very sexy, you know, in, wasn't a, really an intellectual, but he was very much uh, a flavor of the, of the day then. And he wanted her to do Barbarella, and there was no way she wasn't going to do it, because he was her husband, because he was going to direct it. And then when she was living in France and got pregnant, 
and she was uh, had to lie down a lot during her pregnancy because she was uh, fraught in some way. And so she's is 68 and she's watching television and she's seeing what's going on. Also, there was a great student revolution in Paris in 1968. But she's watching what's going on in her own country and she's saying, I don't understand. And she kind of had an awakening, helped along a lot by a very famous French actress named Simone Signore. And she said, I have to go home. I have to go home and become part of whatever's happening there. And when she came back, um, she did a very incredible film uh, called They Shoot Horses, Don't They? And it was her first actually ser serious role that required her to dig very deep. And because her mother had killed herself, and this is about a woman who wants someone to kill her, to put her out of her pain, she really drew on some great emotional reserves to do that to do that film. And it's very interesting because she wore a wig for that film, and she says in the film that she said that film was over, and I took my wig off, and I still had this long blonde Barbarella hair, and I knew it was not me anymore. And so she goes to a barber and says, "Cut it off," and she ends up with the clute hairdo. Uh, which, by the way, I, as a young girl, imitated. I <laughs> <laughs> wanted the clute hairdo. It was the first shag haircut. Seriously, it was so uh, wonderful. And, uh, of course, that's a very deep role as well. And she got nominated for an Oscar. I think she probably won it. She won the Oscar for for, yeah. Yeah. for that. And then and it's off to the races. She's no longer going to be doing anything that wasn't important. Uh, that wasn't serious. I mean, she had done Barefoot in the Park, which I don't think she regrets. But, and, but more importantly, uh, she then became a producer. She recognized at a certain point that she could use film as a, as a tool for social justice and uh, made a series of very important films, including Coming Home, uh, which was her way of, in a sense, almost apologizing for the mistakes she made during the Vietnam War, uh, nine to five, which started an entire revolution of working women saying, we demand equality. Uh, and and uh, China Syndrome, which she produced and everybody said, oh, what are you doing this movie for this ridiculous and three weeks later, Three Mile uh, Island happened and it was totally prescient. So, um, she really used film, she not only transformed herself as an actress, she transformed how she used film um, in her in the interest of, po of political change. Yeah, and I think um, one of the most touching moments in the movie too, um, both in her career and in her personal life is uh, when it all comes to On Golden Pond, mm -hmm. um, you know, the film that she made with her father that, that uh, won him the Academy Award and that really uh, drew upon a lot of their own real life pain. She she produced that uh, head to toe, uh, and it it was absolutely drawing on her own difficulties with her father, and which played out in the film. I mean, <laughs> I don't know that Henry Fonda realized because uh, you know one of the things that she had. Um, he had done to her when she was a child. So he told her she was fat. He was ashamed of her because she, he thought she was fat. She wasn't fat. She wasn't real thin. She was a young girl who still had, you know, kind of chipmunk cheeks. And that created in her body image issues, which lasted her entire life to the extent that she was bulimic for 30 some years. And the first thing that that her father in the film says to her is, oh, welcome home, that fat, fat little girl. Uh, you know, I mean, I couldn't believe that that the uh, how much that film mirrored her own seriously it wasn't even tr pretending not to her relationship with her father, and it did it did it did cause. I don't think he was ever the kind of guy who could ever say, "Oh, Jane, I love you. I'm so sorry. I've never told you before," but I think it helped their relationship a great deal. Yeah, I remember there's a moment in the movie, uh, and, and in your movie as well, where she's talking about, uh, and I forget the specific scene, so forgive me, but um, where he does, his character basically says something that uh, relates to their real life, and in that sense, you know. She says to him, I want to have, I want to have 
it's time in the time for us to have a relationship. Yes, thank you, thank you. He says, me. "What do you mean?" She said, "Like fa like a father daughter relationship." And he answers, "What are you worried about the will?" But <laughs> um, don't worry, I've left everything to you except what I'm taking with me. Uh, but there's a scene where she had purposely. Uh, she knew how he liked to rehearse completely. He didn't do anything that wasn't rehearsed. And so she waited for that moment where um, she says something to him and he, she puts his hand, puts her hand on his hand and he tears up because he wasn't expecting it. He didn't know it was coming, but it's something about it touched him. That's nice. and, and that and her describing that and the meaning that had for her that he, I saw a tear. She said, I saw a tear. Uh, it was really touching. It was amazing how our parents affect us. Yeah. Really, absolutely. really affect us. And um, I think she finally came to terms that, and, and Tom Hayden, who was her husband at the time, says the fact that he could never use those three words and say, I love you, was a tragedy. But you could tell by his eyes and his body language that he, he loved her very much. So. Um, so talk a bit about talking to Jane Fonda. Uh, was she an easy interview subject? I would say yeah, uh, because she had written a book. So the process of, I mean, she'd written a book 20 years before I, almost 20 years before I made this film, but, and a lot had happened in the meantime, but she wasn't, she had been ready to tell her story. So, um, I mean, I think that it's very different to write in the privacy of your writing room, uh, these very painful uh, things that happened to her, these very painful admissions about mistakes she had made and regrets that she had. It's quite another to say it on camera. And she really had not done that. I mean, I think she probably a few times had to answer for sitting on an anti-war, uh, anti-aircraft gun, which she should have had to answer for. Uh, but I don't, she'd never told her story on camera this way. And, so I don't think it was easy for her, but she, a strong woman, she was ready to tell her story. And as she said, why tell it if you're not going to tell the truth and you're not going to tell it, why do it? And I think she felt that, that her story re would resonate as I did, which is the reason I wanted to make the film is I felt that her story would resonate with women everywhere. Uh, for one reason or another, everyone has had some aspect of her story and so many. I mean, everybody, not everybody, but a lot of women have suffered from bulimia and body issues. Lots of women have problems with their parents. Lots of women have problems with their children. Lots of women have had problems with unfaithful husbands. I mean, it goes on and on. So there were aspects of her story that I felt would resonate with lots and lots of women, and it did. But that's also why she was so open. She felt her story, these things can happen to me. Famous rich movie star, they can happen to anybody. And she felt that telling it as honestly as she could would help people. And uh, so we were kind of in that together to get to truth. Right. And I mean, one of the things that you see in this film is that, um, you know, she's not slowing down at any point. Uh, when you're making the film, uh, uh, you're, uh, she was, uh, I think, just finished up uh, youth and was on the uh, campaign trail for that, as it were. And uh, she was uh, doing activism work as well. So, I mean, she shows no signs of uh, ever slowing down. What was what was uh, like being around her at, at those points? She's one of the only well-known actresses, maybe there were one or two others, but who went to Standing Rock and <laughs> served Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, this woman doesn't, she puts her money where she, her, her mouth is, and she's out on the front lines. And I have such respect for this. One of my favorite images in the film is where, I think it's after, it's after Trump, that's what I did. And, and uh, she's in the streets, and her granddaughter's in front of her, and she has her hands on her granddaughter's shoulders, and they're chanting, and she's pushing. Oh, it was so beautiful to see this passing on to another generation, uh, her commitment and her passion for speaking up and uh, for the right thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it certainly uh, resonates today, always. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, it's uh, pretty faithful that we're talking about this at a time when uh, you know so many of our states are passing laws that are 
going to make it harder for women to have agency over their own bodies. And I always think of Jane Fonda in this, these instances. I'm dying to talk to her about it. I'm going to be seeing her in about a week. Um, and I'm, I'm really dying to talk to her about what, what she, what, what, or, you know, I mean, I know she's involved in some way with dealing with this, but we all need to be involved. I mean, the thing about Jane is she is such a call to action that, um, and such an example uh, that you don't just sit in your living room and complain. Oh, what's going on in the world? She's out there trying to change it uh, from the ground up. Now she's really busy. She can't always do that when she's shooting a TV series, but in between, I remember when we were making the film, uh, I'd have to organize my interviews with her on downtime when she, number one, wasn't shooting Grace and Frankie and when she wasn't on the, on the, on the road, you know, campaigning for things <laughs> because that's really her passion. Uh, and, you know, she says in the film, I guess a lot of people, thought, you know, because she, she's going to be, she's, gonna, she's past 80. She's past that mark. Thought, you know, oh, she's going to slow down. This is the time she'll, you know, knit or something. She's like, are you kidding me? Uh, <laughs> and I mean, she's never been busier. Uh, she, I don't know if she's got another movie happening, but this series takes a lot of work, and she gets up very early. She's very disciplined. And um, But when she's not doing that, She's organizing. I have to say, it's pretty. Uh, speaking of Grace and Frankie, that's the show she does with Lily Tomlin, another octogenarian. It's, it's very inspiring to see so many uh, people in their late seventies and eighties signing long-term contracts on television shows and remaining One. politically active. <laughs> and they have <laughs> such a good time together. I was on the set there. I mean, they love each other. They have such a good time, and uh, you know, and it it deals with all the issues of aging in a very honest way. Uh, so she's continuing to be relevant uh, in every possible way. I mean, she's amazing. I love making this film um, and interviewing her. I did 20 hours of just interview and many other hours where we just spent talking and going to her, um, going to her boarding school where she went after her mother killed herself, and which for the first time provided some stability and sense of belonging uh, to lots of other places with her. So we spent a lot of time together. And you know, you make a film about somebody and you you spend then a year, <laughs> year, you know, making, doing the interviews and then you've spent a year or more in the edit room crafting this film and looking at their face every day and and then it's over, you gotta miss them. This <laughs> 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 is what I miss. <laughs> Indeed, I, well, I mean, you've made films about a lot of interesting people like that. I mean, just last year we were talking about your Steven Spielberg documentary. Uh, I mean, what attracts you to the people you make movies about? Well, first of all, there has to be some kind of, a, a for me, uh, a body of work that is connected somehow to the life that makes it an interesting film to make. Um, then there has to be a good story within that. It is a visual medium, it is a storytelling medium. So you can have the greatest writer in the world that you admire, and, uh, but it, there may not be enough of a story or enough ways to tell that story. So it is about material, it's about body of work, and it's it's about an openness, you know, whether they're willing to go there. And I've also made films about people who uh, are not living. I mean, one of my favorite films I made was about Leonard Bernstein, and he had been dead for 10 years. But the story is so dramatic and so so much visual material and there were so many people left really important people who had been there uh, that it, it was a very powerful film um, I don't know if that answers it very well but I mean it's what everybody's looking for you're looking for a good story you're looking for somebody who's willing to go there with you and that's the first that's the first thing you know not oh yes I'll, con I'll consent to two interviews uh, that's not going to do it. You know, it's got to be somebody who's willing to go the path and go the distance and understands that you're trying to make something that's not a Reader's Digest version, you know, of their life and their work. It is a, it's a deep dive into where the life and the work and the career and the, the work that's had an impact on people, how those things connect. Uh, and that's, that's very hard to do. Yeah. But that's what I'm looking for. Uh, well, I think you do it very well. Uh, just... Uh... Uh, just uh, personally speaking. Uh, Susan Lacey, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you. Bye-bye.
Bye. Uh, and thanks to all of you for at home for watching. Make sure you hit the subscribe button below and make sure you visit us at goldderby.com for all the latest Emmy news.